Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. Littleton Coin Company is ringing in the holiday season with daily deals. Visit LittletonCoin.com for at least 15% off select products now through November 28th. Save on your favorite coins, such as Morgan Silver Dollars, Kennedy Half Dollars, Commemorative Quarters, and much more. But hurry, each day offers a new deal you don't want to miss. Visit us now at LittletonCoin.com. That's LittletonCoin.com. Littleton Coin Company, serving collectors since 1945. This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 89, for broadcast on the 4th of August, 2021. Coming up on Space Time, a new map of the Milky Way's halo, NASA's Mars Perseverance rover ready to collect its first samples, and Norway treated to a spectacular meteor light show. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have developed a spectacular new map of the galactic halo, the outermost region of our Milky Way galaxy. The galactic halo lies beyond the swirling arms that form the Milky Way's recognisable central disk and is a region sparsely populated with stars. Although the halo may appear mostly empty, it's also predicted to contain a massive reservoir of dark matter, a mysterious invisible substance thought to make up the bulk of the mass of the universe. The new map, published in the journal Nature, reveals how a satellite dwarf galaxy orbiting the Milky Way, known as the Large Magellanic Cloud, has sailed through the Milky Way's galactic halo like a ship through water, with its gravity producing a wake in the stars behind it. The Large Magellanic Cloud is located around 160,000 light-years from Earth and is just a quarter the mass of the Milky Way. Though the inner portions of the galactic halo have already been mapped with a higher level of accuracy, this new map's the first to provide a similar picture of the halo's outer regions where this weight can be found, between 200,000 and 325,000 light years from the galactic centre. While previous studies have hinted at the wake's existence, this new all-sky map is the first to confirm its presence, offering a detailed view of its shape, size and location. This disturbance in the halo also provides astronomers with a unique opportunity to study something they can't observe directly, dark matter. Although they have no idea what dark matter really is, astronomers know it exists because they can see its gravitational influence on galaxies, stopping them from spinning apart as they rotate. Dark matter is estimated to be around five times more common in the universe than all the normal matter, which makes up all the stars, planets, asteroids, houses, cars, dogs, cats, trees and people. While there are multiple theories about the nature of dark matter, almost all of them conclude that it should be present in the Milky Way's halo. And if that's the case, then as the large Magellanic cloud sails through this region, it should leave a wake in the dark matter as well. So, the wake observed in this new star map is thought to be the outline of this dark matter wake. Think of the stars as being like leaves on the surface of this invisible ocean, with their position shifting due to the effect of dark matter. The interaction between dark matter and the Large Magellanic Cloud has big implications for our galaxy. As the Large Magellanic Cloud orbits the Milky Way, the dark matter drags on the cloud and slows it down. Now over time, this will cause the dwarf galaxy's orbit to get smaller and smaller and smaller, until eventually the galaxy will collide with the Milky Way in about 2 billion years' time. Now mind you, the Milky Way is already dragging stars and gas from the Large Magellanic Cloud, as well as its companion dwarf galaxy, the Small Magellanic Cloud, located about 200,000 light years away. These types of mergers are thought to be a key driver in the growth of massive galaxies across the universe. And the Milky Way is certainly no exception to this rule. It's already cannibalized numerous small galaxies. And in addition to the large and small Magellanic Clouds, it's also cannibalizing both the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy and the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. And in around 4.7 billion years from now, the Milky Way itself will merge into the larger Andromeda galaxy M31. The new map, along with additional data and theoretical analyses, may provide a test for different theories about the nature of dark matter, such as whether it consists of particles like regular matter, and if so, what the properties of those particles are. 
In order to build their map, the authors charted the positions of over 1,300 stars in the galactic halo. Their challenge was trying to measure the exact distances from Earth to a large proportion of these stars. The problem being it's often impossible to determine whether a star is faint nearby or bright and far away. The authors initially used data from the European Space Agency's Gaia mission. This provided the location of many stars in the sky, but couldn't measure distances to the stars in the Milky Way's outer regions. After identifying stars most likely located in the halo, because they weren't obviously inside our galaxy or in the Large Magellanic Cloud, the authors looked for a class of giant stars to have specific light signatures detectable by NASA's NEOWISE, the Near-Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer spacecraft. Knowing the basic properties of these stars allowed astronomers to figure out their distance from Earth and therefore create their new map. The map charts a region starting about 200,000 light years from the Milky Way center about where the Large Magellanic Cloud's wake was predicted to begin and then extends some 125,000 light years beyond that. The data was then combined with computer models predicting what dark matter in the galactic halo should be like and one of these models accurately predicted the general structure and specific location of the star's wake revealed in the new map, suggesting that this model is correct. Findings also suggest that the Large Magellanic Cloud is likely on its first orbit around the Milky Way. See, had it already made several orbits, the shape and location of the wake would have been significantly different to what's been observed. But its next orbit should be much shorter, due to its interaction with the Milky Way galaxy. This is space time. Still to come, NASA's Mars Perseverance rover ready to collect its first samples, and Norway treated to a spectacular meteor light show. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. NASA's Mars Perseverance rover has laid the groundwork for the mission's next major milestone, collecting its first samples from the red planet for eventual return to Earth. Perseverance is operating near its landing site, a dried-out river delta in the red planet's Jezero crater. The area contains a myriad of geological sediments washed down from higher upstream. Importantly, it's also a likely place to find evidence of past microbial life on Mars, if it ever existed. Right now, the six-wheeled car-sized rover is examining a four-square-kilometre patch known as the Cratered Floor Fractured Rough that's thought to contain Jezero's deepest and most ancient layers of exposed bedrock. The sampling sequence will include performing an imagery survey so mission managers can determine the exact best location for taking the first sample and a separate nearby target site for proximity science in order to get some valuable first-hand data on the rock about to be sampled. This will involve performing a detailed in-situ analysis using an abrading tool to scrape off the top layers of the rock and dust in order to expose the fresh, unweathered material. The newly exposed surface will then be cleaned with a gas dust removal tool and then carefully examined with the rover's turret-mounted proximity science instruments Sherlock, Pixel and Watson to provide mineral and chemical analysis. Perseverance's SuperCam and MassCam Z instruments located on the rover's mast will also participate. SuperCam will fire a laser at the abraded surface, spectroscopically studying the resulting plume and collecting other data, while MassCam Z will capture high resolution imagery. The actual sampling operation will take place the next day, with a sampling handling arm retrieving a sample tube from inside the rover, heating it, and then inserting it into a coring bit. A device called the bit carousel then transports the tube and the drill bit to a rotary percussive drill on Perseverance's robotic arm. This will then drill into the rock near the location of the previous day's proximity science examination. Scientists expect to collect the core samples several centimetres long. Perseverance's arm will then move the bit and tube combination back into the bit carousel, which will transfer it into an adaptive caching assembly, where the sample will be measured for volume, photographed, and medically sealed, and stored. And there it will wait for the sample return mission. 
The next time the sample tube contents will be seen will be in a clean room facility on Earth, where they'll be analysed using scientific instruments much too large to send to Mars. This report from NASA TV. In terms of robots that go into space, the sampling and caching system on the Mars 2020 mission is the most complicated, most sophisticated thing that we know how to build. This is a system that allows us to take core samples of rocky material on the surface of Mars, carefully seal them in very sterile, clean vessels for eventual return to Earth. We've been working on the sampling and caching system for seven years, and that's because it's a tough job. We're testing the equipment to make sure that it's going to work when we get to Mars. It has to function on its own. We have to think of all eventual possibilities and try them here first. And then if they don't work, change it now uh, because we can't make any changes later. To drill into the rock on Mars, pull out intact core samples, seal them hermetically, and to be all done autonomously by a robot hanging off the end of a rover on the surface of Mars has been a challenge. We've got actually three robots necessary to do the sample and caching system. Our big robotic arm out on the front of the rover, that takes our drill, pushes it against the surface and allows us to take core samples. Then we put that core sample in the bit carousel, the second robot that takes that from the robot arm and puts it down inside our adaptive caching system. This is the part of the sample and caching system inside the rover. We've got a little tiny robot, a special robot arm called the Shaw, the sample handling arm. It takes the samples out of the carousel and moves them through volume assessment, image taking, and eventually to sealing, and then replaces the cylinder containing the sample in a storage spot, all on its own in the matter of a few hours. We have designs on bringing them back in a decade. Mars has been at the fore of our consciousness about the questions of life. Could life exist in one of our nearest neighbors? I think we have a lot to learn, life or no life, about the evolution of our solar system, about our planet, by looking in depth at rocks brought back from Mars. And in that report from NASA TV, we heard from Mars 2020 Chief Engineer Adam Stelzner and Spacecraft Systems Integration and Test Lead Kelly Palm, both of whom are with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. This is Space Time. Still to come, Norway treated to a spectacular meteor light show and the oldest methane cycling Archaea fossils ever discovered. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, they're used to spectacular auroral displays from the northern lights in the skies above Norway. But scientists are now scouring the forests and hillsides near the Norwegian capital Oslo, looking for the remains of a big meteor which blazed across the night sky, illuminating much of southern Scandinavia. Witnesses report seeing bright flashes, followed by loud explosions. Local law enforcement received a flurry of emergency calls, but there have been no reports of any injuries or damage. The Norwegian Meteor Service, which has a number of cameras continually monitoring the skies, says the fireball was travelling at about 16.3 kilometres per second and was visible for at least five seconds as it streaked across the sky in the country's southeast. Initial estimates suggest the space rock may have weighed about 10 kilograms. The meteor first appeared about 90 kilometres north of Oslo, travelling in a southwesterly direction, before fragmenting into several flashes of light and impacting the ground in a wooded area known as Finnemarka, about 60 kilometres west of Oslo. This is Space Time. Still to come, discovery of the oldest fossils of methane cycling microbes. And SpaceX wins NASA's Europa Clipper launch contract. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
Littleton Coin Company is ringing in the holiday season with daily deals. Visit littletoncoin.com for at least 15% off select products now through November 28th. Save on your favorite coins, such as Morgan Silver Dollars, Kennedy Half Dollars, Commemorative Quarters, and much more. But hurry, each day offers a new deal you don't want to miss. Visit us now at littletoncoin.com. That's littletoncoin.com. Littleton Coin Company, serving collectors since 1945. Scientists have discovered the oldest known fossils of methane-cycling microbes. The remains were found in two thin layers of rock collected from the Barberton Greenstone belt in South Africa, which contains some of the oldest and best-preserved sedimentary rocks found on Earth. The microbes lived in a hydrothermal vent system beneath the seafloor 3.42 billion years ago. Subsurface habitats heated by volcanic activity are likely to have hosted some of Earth's earliest microbial ecosystems. And this is the oldest example found to date. The study's lead author, Barbara Cavallazzi from the University of Bologna, says these archaea prokaryotes appear to have flourished along walls of cavities created by warm water from hydrothermal vent systems a few metres below the seafloor. The microfossils, reported in the journal Science Advances, have a carbon-rich outer sheath and a chemically and structurally distinct core, consistent with a cell wall or membrane around intracellular or cytoplasmic matter. The interaction of cooler seawater with warmer subsurface hydrothermal vent fluids would have created a rich chemical soup with variations in conditions leading to multiple potential microhabitats. The clusters of filaments were found at the tips of pointed hollows in the walls of the cavities, whereas individual filaments were spread across the cavity floor. Chemical analysis shows that the filaments include most of the major elements needed for life. Concentrations of nickel in organic compounds provide evidence of primordial metabolisms and are consistent with nickel content found in modern-day microbes known as archaea prokaryotes, which live in the absence of oxygen and use methane for their metabolism. It's thought that life in the oceans of other worlds, such as the Jovian moon Europa and Saturn's ice moon Enceladus, could possibly host similar life forms. This is space time. Still to come. NASA has selected SpaceX to launch its Europa Clipper mission. And later in the science report, Russia tests its new Zircon hypersonic cruise missile. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA has selected SpaceX to launch its Europa Clipper mission to the Jovian system in 2024. The spacecraft, which was supposed to fly aboard NASA's new heavy lift rocket, the SLS, will instead be launched aboard a Falcon Heavy from the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The planned voyage to Jupiter's icy moon Europa is a huge win for Elon Musk's company as it sets its sights on deeper missions into the solar system. The SLS, which is slated to undertake its maiden flight to the moon later this year on the Artemis I mission, has been plagued by delays and cost overruns. The 6,000-kilogram Europa Clipper orbiter is expected to achieve Jovian orbit insertion in April 2030, undertaking some 50 close flybys of Europa in order to study the ice moon and its global subsurface ocean and to try and determine whether or not it could harbour conditions suitable for life. This is Space Time. Littleton Coin Company is ringing in the holiday season with daily deals. Visit littletoncoin.com for at least 15% off select products now through November 28th. Save on your favorite coins, such as Morgan Silver Dollars, Kennedy Half Dollars, Commemorative Quarters, and much more. But hurry, each day offers a new deal you don't want to miss. Visit us now at littletoncoin.com. That's littletoncoin.com. Littleton Coin Company, serving collectors since 1945. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study suggests that nerve fibre loss and an increase in a type of immune cell known as a dendritic cell found on the surface of the eye may be an identifying feature for long COVID. 
A report in the British Journal of Ophthalmology found that these changes were most noticeable among people with neurological symptoms such as a loss of taste and smell, headaches, dizziness, numbness and neuropathic pain following COVID-19 infection. The authors used lasers to look for nerve damage and the density of dendritic cells in the eyes of 40 people believed to have long COVID and compared them with scans of 30 healthy people who had never caught COVID-19. The authors found that COVID patients had greater nerve damage and loss with a higher number of dendritic cells than those who had never caught COVID-19. The World Health Organization estimates over 8 million people have been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus, with over 4.2 million confirmed fatalities and some 196 million people infected since the deadly disease first spread out of Wuhan, China. A new study has warned that most of Australia's 1,300 threatened plant species aren't being monitored, increasing their risk of extinction. A report in the journal Biological Conservation found almost two-thirds, 63% of threatened Australian plants aren't receiving any monitoring according to a national assessment. Scientists warn that without adequate monitoring, threatened species could slip into extinction without anyone noticing or having sufficient time to act. The study examined how well more than 800 threatened plants on the federal government's threatened species list are being monitored and compared the findings with monitoring for threatened animals. Scientists found that orchids, shrubs and trees generally had better monitoring than herbs, ferns or other plant types. Moscow has undertaken a successful test of its new Zircon hypersonic cruise missile, with Russian President Vladimir Putin describing it as invincible. The missile was launched from the warship Admiral Gorshkov, reaching speeds of almost Mach 7 before hitting its target in the Barents Sea coast in northern Russia, 350 kilometres away. Putin had earlier claimed Zircon has a range of 1,000 kilometres and a top speed of Mach 9. The Russian Defence Ministry says it has plans to equip both warships and submarines with the new Zircon. In recent years, Russia's boasted of developing several new generation missiles designed to circumvent existing defence systems, including the Zarmat intercontinental ballistic missile and the Burevestik nuclear-powered cruise missile. However, things haven't always gone smoothly. A deadly blast at a test site in northern Russia in August 2019, which caused local radiation levels to suddenly skyrocket, is believed to have been caused by the failure of a Burevestnik cruise missile. See, these missiles are powered by nuclear thermal rocket engines. These engines use heat from a small nuclear reactor to superheat liquid hydrogen, causing it to expand dramatically faster than conventional chemical reactions and so achieve far greater thrust. This theoretically doubles or triples the payload capacity and increases the speed potential. A new study warns that excessive caffeine consumption could increase your risk of osteoporosis. Researchers looked at the impact of high-dose short-term caffeine intake on renal clearance of calcium, sodium and creatinine in healthy adults. The findings, reported in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology, found that people who consume 8 average cups of coffee a day will have a 77% increase in calcium in their urine, creating a potential deficiency which could impact their bone density. Mind you, the average daily intake of caffeine is usually just 2 cups of coffee, While drinking 8 cups of coffee a day might seem like a lot, there are a significant percentage of people out there who would fall into this category, including teens who binge consuming energy drinks and just about every broadcaster and journalist I know. Apple have released their new iOS 14.7 update. It's designed to specifically combat the highly successful Pegasus security spyware developed by private Israeli tech firm NSO. Details of Pegasus were recently exposed by the University of Toronto's Citizen Lab. Pegasus works by sending a trap link to a target smartphone that persuades the victim to tap and activate. But more importantly, it's designed so it can also self-activate without any input at all. Simply by contacting your phone, puts it into the phone. Once installed, the spyware then captures and copies most of the phone's functions and then secretly sends that data to an operative who can use it to map out sensitive details of a target's life. Pegasus can collect emails, call records, social media posts, user passwords, contact lists, pictures, videos, sound recordings, browsing histories, activate cameras and microphones, listen to calls and voicemails, and collect location logs of both where the user has been and determine where the user is now. 
It can even indicate whether the person's stationary or moving, and if so, in which direction. But Pegasus' real genius, apart from being able to self-install, is its ability to plant data on the target's phone as well. That means you can use it to set people up. Pegasus has already been an invaluable tool for spy agencies and law enforcement departments around the world. Among the 50,000 or so estimated Pegasus targets were more than 2,000 Islamic terrorists, several hundred left-wing activists, and hundreds of criminals. NSO insists its software is only intended for use in fighting terrorism and other crimes, and says it's been exported to governments in 45 countries. But it's been revealed that criminals and terrorists weren't the only targets, with well over 600 politicians, 180 journalists, and 65 business leaders also targeted. The Israeli government has now set up a committee to review the firm's business, including the process through which the export licenses were granted. The latest Apple patch will help iPhone users counter Pegasus. With the details on this and more, we're joined by Alex Zaharov-Royt from ITY.com. Well, it's another patch for security issues. Now, Apple says that an application may be able to execute arbitrary code with kernel privileges. So this means hackers could break into your phone by loading code into this vulnerability that will then give it kernel privileges, which is like the As root opposed access. to captain or, or major or general. <laughs> or general. <laughs> it just means that, that people can log into your operating system and load their own software, which means they could run key loggers or activate your cameras. And mm. this is sort of partially in response to the Pegasus malware that was being used by nation states to target uh, activists. And uh, Apple says that this issue has been actively exploited. And we've seen that several times during iOS 14, where there have been updates that have closed security vulnerabilities. So it's definitely important to update your iPhone, your iPad, and also if you have, I think, Apple TV, but also your Mac. Mac OS Big Sur 11.5.1 is also available and fixes the same sort of issues. Now, iOS 14.7 supported the new MagSafe battery pack for people with an iPhone 12. They, if you had a HomePod, you could access more than one timer by voice. You had uh, more places giving air quality support uh, in terms of you know, air quality in different countries, if your country offers that, and updates to the podcast. And a lot of people People often are stuck on older iOS versions that they just ignore the updates from Apple. It's definitely important for your own security to update to the latest version as soon as you can. I saw a meme the other day, which has been around for a while. It shows a, a chunk of concrete, and in that chunk of concrete is a Nokia phone, and it's still working. So, um, <laughs> why doesn't it surprise me that Nokia has launched a new life-proof Android smartphone? It's called the Nokia XR20. It's all about having a point of difference. I mean, in a sea of cheap smartphones that churned out by the millions are two, three, four, five hundred dollars. I mean, at some of those prices, especially for the cheaper ones, if you damage it, it's just cheaper to buy a new one. Yeah. Uh, but having a phone that can withstand the rough and tumble of everyday life, as Nokia puts it, and also comes with four years of monthly security updates and also a three-year warranty and three years of OS upgrades, with the three years of OS upgrades, something that Nokia is doing across its range. And the screen it's replacement. Probably, That's pretty Well, also business, one, yeah. yeah one free screen replacement should you break it during the first year of purchase. They're using Corning Gorilla Victus glass, which is supposed to be one of the toughest types of glass out there for smartphones. Now, this phone in Australian dollars is $879. So it's it's definitely heading up towards the upper mid-range. It's not as expensive as a $1,000 or $2,000 smartphone, obviously, but it's not as cheap as the three, four, five dollars $500 phones, of which there are some great 499 Android phones out there. But this one is meant to be able to be dropped from 1.8 meters. It can be in water for 1.8 meters of water for an hour. It can withstand temperatures of up to minus 20, although they don't want you to freeze it on purpose. It's got a Qualcomm Snapdragon 485G chip. Yeah, now the Qualcomm 4 series, I mean, you've got the Qualcomm 6, 7, and 8 series. The Qualcomm 888 is currently the top of the line Snapdragon processor. And during the call for journalists that was uh, previewing this phone before the launch, which is coming on August the 12th, one of the journalists said, well, hang on, how come you're using the 4 series chip? You know, this is sort of like you know, definitely a sort of a, a mid-range, maybe even a lower mid-range chip. It's not really one of the more performant chips like 6, 7, or 8. And the executive said, well, look, we're not really sure why Qualcomm called the 480 series a 4 series. We think it's much more like a 6 series. And you know, given that they're going to support this for at least four years and they're promising great performance out of it with 6 gig of RAM, 128 gig of SSD, the ability to put in a up to 512 gig micro SD card, and they've got 3.5 millimeter headphone socket, USB-C, I mean, it's, you know, and a 6.67 inch screen. So they say the processor is definitely more than good enough for the everyday things that people are doing and they're confident in it. That's Alex Sahara of Royt from ity.com. And 
that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. New on Curiosity Stream. How do you connect a 16th century potato to limitless energy production? Could Napoleon's toothpick have a direct link to a machine that predicts the future? And how can a 1700s conch shell chart a course to humans connecting their brains to the internet? James Burke's visionary series Connections returns for a new generation. Experience all new Connections. With monthly, annual, and bundled plans, find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com.